very much for coming. It's talking about a pretty relevant topic here after this summer. Uh, it's sort of regarded as the record fire season for Canada. Uh, historically, it would probably represent maybe 20% of an average fire year in the long term. So it's a big deal for us in our society to have a big fire season like that this year. But historically, there would be much more fire on the continent. And, uh, but it does make news that it, uh, it's the biggest historically recorded thing when you think that it's been only since about 1920 we've been recording fire statistics. So obviously, uh, I want to discuss tonight that we can do fire starting locally to protect our houses and our communities. But I'm going to really try and make the point that we need to make the steam itself to a landscape level. And of course, we look at Camelot Corridor and what Camelot Cam used to look like in the valley bottom there, surrounded by a corridor that was used by bison, used by Native people, frequently burned. And then look what we saw today, uh, quite a change. And uh, a lot of fuel, a lot more fuel accumulation, a lot less meadows. But you can really see that signal of the long-term uh, indigenous use in the valley. And the railroad came along and did a lot of burning right after it came through, but it just barely replicated the amount of burning that indigenous people had done before that. We've had virtually two or three decades now of almost extreme fire behavior in a lot of communities. But you know, in the, in the initial settlement period, say in 1908 or Wallace, Idaho in 1910, those communities were quite hot and, and uh, there were a lot of fires in that period, but certainly the last 20 or 30 years has been uh, amazing, uh, starting with about 2000 in Los Alamos, uh, Kelowna, major fires in California, Paradise, and then, you know, sort of a, a repeat of Kelowna shoe swap fires this summer in 2023. And one of the issues with these is not only the massive property damage, loss, massive threat to life, et cetera. But uh, just the, the needs for evacuations and long term removals of people from communities uh, really is a, a, an incredible uh, disruption to living in, a, and especially in a narrow valley like this, where you'd be filled with smoke for weeks, threatened by fire. Columbia Valley was similar this year, the shoe swap too. It really does uh, uh, vote for uh, serious times ahead. And of course, the, the, the issue for emergency responders. Uh, this is getting really serious in terms of, of threats to life and uh, and folks that are trying to get people and get them to safe places. And the most recent uh, real tragedy uh, was about 10 years ago in uh, Arizona, where a whole fire crew was, was eliminated by trying to uh, save a town here, here now. So tonight, I'm just going to work through sort of the basics of the fire, uh, what we used to call a fire triangle, but I'm going to add the human dimension to that, so we'll call it the fire box. And we'll discuss that a little bit. I'm going to spare a bit of time about people and fire and how fires used to burn the long term and how they burn today. I'm going to discuss what we can do in terms of being fire smart, especially just at your, your initial house or your local area. And then I'm going to work out to what the regional landscape could be and how we might be quite innovative in Canmore to being uh, managing fire on a regional basis. And then I'm going to try and come up with sort of an idea for the future about what we might do for a sort of a 20 to 40 year initiative to try and make camera a prototype uh, fire smart community that not just at the local block level, but also right out to the parks that surround us. So here's our fire blocks. And uh, it's sort of these are the, the, the things that sort of really regulate how much fire there in the landscape. Uh, the obviously the one that's you know sort of day by day is weather, uh, but then there's topography, fuel, and then a big one which we're going to discuss a lot tonight is humans and governance, because that in essence, really determines how much fire is going to be out there over, over the long term and what that fire will be like. And let's look at the historical landscape. First of all, there was a long term landscape, and these are the ecocultural biomes of North America, Northwest North America, the big ones being the coast of Plateau Salmon to the west, the South Arctic and Moose and Caribou system to the north, and the prairie mixed with bison. And there were hundreds of indigenous uh, folks that, uh, groups of indigenous folks that lived in this landscape. Uh, as was pointed out earlier, we're on the Dakota uh, home country right now, but uh, they were surrounded by folks. So this was a very dynamic landscape. But what's interesting is that each of these people, in a sense, in, in a sense, where they lived on the landscape, they were like a key fitting into a lock. They knew how to live on that landscape. They had a seasonal round about where they would be during the season, what resources they would be doing, when they would burn, when they would harvest various crops. So they were very plugged into their landscape. And they had a feedback system that worked throughout the year. 
and as years vary. And so they were much more closely located, you know, integrated into their landscape than we are today. And, uh, and so it's important to look at that. And the seasonal rounds that are, you know, that these are the most intricate things you could ever imagine for folks to describe how they used to live day by day, month by month, season by season, what resources they used to use, what times of the year they would burn. And these should be really, you know, really important that we understand how these work. And we're, especially in our part of the Rocky Mountains, just only beginning now to see, uh, can we get rid of that, you are screen sharing there? Yeah. Where'd that pop up? Yeah, okay, we're gonna get some technical help here. Plus, this this is the slide show because it is right now. <laughs> oh, that yeah, was not good. <laughs> 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 If you look at the seasonal route for the indigenous folks of Cheney Rock, he's a Stony Dakota. We need a lot more work done on this yet, but we think they probably burn twice per season, late uh, in terms of purposeful burning, late in the fall, early in the, late in the fall, early in the spring, and then this tied into the resources they would use and then where they would travel throughout the season. And then, of course, this is one from Australia. I think it's seasonal rounds from Australia. They fire was used routinely in Australia. But what's amazing in these seasonal rounds is not just how intricately they are connected with the landscape, but you know how it commemorates the language. And so there's a lot of work needs to be done, and this shouldn't be lost as the last of the elders you know, get older and disappear. We need to somehow really flesh this out. So you know, if we're talking to the White Museum and anybody doing research here, that let's really try and not just uh, uh, commemorate the, the homeland we're on, but what that homeland is all about. Oh, see, here we go. No, this one is still there. I think I can get on that. So maybe. No, nope, we don't have a slide anymore. Okay. What culture is in the bottom left? That's bottom left is, I think this is uh, just in the upper or the middle Columbia River Valley. Of your luck. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So now we'll just, yeah. So I did, and hopefully, from now on, or maybe in the future, you're quite quickly, we'll see the logical talks and the value will not just commemorate the people that were on the land, but what they did on the land, and let us to really get to understand what, what it's all about. And we got the clicker. Here we go. Good. Let's try it. Okay. Anyways, just stay right there. Yeah. <laughs> good, be good luck. <laughs> Anyways, things have changed. Uh, this, these are the modern anthropologists for the same landscape. And these are standard landscapes that fly across the world now. Uh, the, the, this, the whole world has been mapped with these. And the whole point here is that these are basically uh, regionally or nationally controlled by. Uh, not the seasonal round, but by the political bodies, right from you know the town, town of Camor, or the Van Administration Building, or Edmonton, right up to you know the uh, new headquarters. You know that dictates what goes on these landscapes. And if you have a national park, a national park in China will look just about the same as a national park in Canada. It'll have the same guidance it will, etc. Uh, farmland in Australia will likely have the same palm lines on it as in, in Canada. Same machinery, and they're very standardized. And they're not a seasonal round. They're not very well connected with the landscape at all. They're connected to the local commercialism and global, you know, way of doing business. And they're not. They're going to be insensitive to, you know, when you should burn, should burn, how you should look after your landscape. They're not at all the same as the long-term uh, ecosystem that we inherited. And so, if you look at the transition from what we had, uh, you know, in the past, and we had that for what you know, several hundred centuries, to what we've had here for the last two centuries. You know, that's quite a change from those seasonal rounds to our modern governance. And governance is really playing the main role in this whole story. And if you look back and say, well, what happened to fire regimes that these changed from the biomes that we had, the cultural biomes to the anthrones, you can look back and go to uh, tree rings, fire history, or you could talk with the traditional knowledge and find out what folks were doing. 
And we know what we're doing today with, with large scale fire suppression. But if you just go in and look and say, go through fire history studies based upon tree rings, you can see starting about, in many cases, as early as 1800, the transition happened from loss of fire to very little fire. And this was tied to indigenous population collapse. Uh, eventually, in the last 20 or 30 years, it's tied to fire suppression. But which can read, but the big change really happened uh, about a century ago or a bit before that. And that's when the indigenous people's populations fell. They were, they were moved on to reserves, and the whole seasonal rounds that they had used for hundreds of thousands of years began to collapse. And now we have fire cycles that are you know, way up there from 400 to 1,000 years, in most landscapes right in South uh, across North America. And if you look at that sort of the regional basis again, this is that same sort of scale of map I was looking at, you can see that how what was once a very uh, frequent fire regime in the south, uh, here we are now the center of this, how that has now turned into long fire cycles, very infrequent burning, and only in the north do we have sort of fire cycles that are fairly similar to what happened in the past. And the majority of this, in the south at least, is tied to uh, just the whole removal of native peoples, the way they used to burn, how they used to burn, and now we have long, long fire cycles that are, uh, you know, much longer than before. They're, they're coming to starting to increase again because of fuels, as we'll discuss. But still, we're not burning at, a, at as I mentioned earlier, even a bit of the rate that we used to historically burn. And in terms of locally, we can then go through the tree rings again and look at this. And we can also, in the tree rings, we can look and see you know, what time of year. I was just looking at the time of when the fire scar happens at a tree. You can see when the season of the burn was here. And for Jasper, one of the best fire history studies in North America was done by a guy called Gary Tandy. And this is uh, 200 years of fire in Jasper. And it really shows the pattern of frequent fires in the valley bottom. We started mapping about uh, 1678. This is the valley bottom of Jasper. So frequent fires in the valley bottom, and then periodically a large fire that would go up the valley size. And then again, back to many small fires in the valley, just like you see along the pole in those historic pictures. And then again, a larger fire that would pulse up the valley in 1844, 1846, and again, a bigger fire in 1847. Back to small fires in the valley bottom, and then a big one in 1889. Back to small fires, and after this, the Athabasca Valley didn't burn anymore after 1908. So it's sort of a heartbeat model where you had routine fires in the valley bottom and every once in a while, a bigger fire that would go up the down size. So we moved off from a, you know, an indigenous pattern of burn early, burn often to fire suppression today and a major change in the landscape and also a major change in governance where the folks that used to burn these valley bottoms routinely have now been replaced by uh, major provincial headquarters or federal headquarters to decide how much fire went in there and all the regulations that go with that policy we have today. So we sort of covered who did governance. We go, okay, let's go to some other aspects of the fire blocks we're in. And here's weather. And of course, everybody's very worried about the weather, but it's, you know, there's various levels of weather patterns. And in terms of the fire business, what we're really after is what is the daily weather pattern you're having? You know, what goes on during that day when we can look at fire weather indexes and luckily for that, we can go back to about 1896. And Mark Kathcott, a fellow I worked with for many years, he keeps up databases for several uh, like many, uh, communities around Canada and, and goes back as far as you can go. But there's not a great pattern here for change of uh, amount of burning weather. We get about the same as we did historically. The fire you know, the seasons may have been slightly longer now than they were, you know, warms up a bit sooner cools off a bit later. But in general, you have sort of a, an os oscillation pattern where we fluctuate sort of the cycles of 10 to 20 years. We have big fire cycles in the 1890s, another round in the 20s, 40s, and then today. So uh, quite a bit of fluctuation. And the main issue is that you have longer drying periods, and then you can have a critical period where, back here, you have a frontal pattern will come through, and we had a major one this year on August 18th. And probably many of you remember that day. That was the day that the big fire in Salmon Arm, that's the fire in Kelowna, big fires over the Nipica, uh, scary times in the Invermere Valley. These fires along the here almost took off. Uh, fire took off at Fernie that day. And so during these weather change patterns, a critical weather period, you can have fires maybe move 10 miles or 10 kilometers in a day. 
And uh, and of course, we all saw the national news this year about how that worked out in British Columbia. Now, let's move to another part of the, the firebox, and that's the topography. And those weather patterns, which goes when you have a frontal breakdown, you have very strong west winds. Those get funneled by our mountain valleys and our and our and, and the uh, falls in the valley and notches and passes between them. And those funnel towards in our part of the landscape, you can see how that works for our camp. So we've got you know sort of a major fire shed upwind where we have main green valleys and have older forests that we just discussed. And they're not burning completely. And then these gaps that, that lead us towards our town and towards Van. And the most recent sort of real close call we've had with topography giving us a pretty good idea of what winds will do finally that it really influenced Canmore was uh, the fires that took off in Burton Creek in 2017 and came up and almost went over the pass of Sunshine or Healy Pass. They could have gone over uh, Cinnaboy Pass. They could have gone over Petit Pass. They got much closer to Banff and Canmore than they did. But again, you can see how topography interacts with the wind during the frontal breakdown. It can really drive fires 10, 20 kilometers. Uh, towards our community in a given day. Well, let's look at our last part of the fire box that we want to talk about, and that's fuel. And, you know, I, I do a lot of historic pictures, and I've got a website, you have the card there if you want to look at the pictures. Uh, I've got pictures from all over Northwestern America, and you can really see the change when you take uh, those frequent fires, the valley bottom fires that used to burn here routinely every 10 to 20 years, and you remove those. Uh, we all know what it's done around the South Canmore. Well, what was once open shrubland and grassland is now turning into mature forest. And again, at the Banff, uh, again, uh, uh, the valley bottom is very open. The fires periodically spread up the sides, just like Jasper. Uh, in 50 or 100 years, the fires have spread up the valley sides. But uh, uh, over the last 100 years, especially since the fires in the relative were controlled, that, that's feeding the overgrowth. So we have continuous fuels now. Uh, going you know, right up and down the bull valley and inside that one. And about 20 years ago, before that, well, 40 years ago, I had four, two or three summers on my hands and knees counting twigs, uh, calculating biomass in the various ecoregions. And I was just looking at okay, what given fire frequency, what happens in time. And this was the historic pattern, which really broke up the fires, uh, broke up the biomass. But the last 100 years, was steadily in almost all the various ecoregions from the upper subalpine to the montane. We're going to sort of maximum biomass, which will be about three, four hundred tons per hectare. And you get about a, if you want to look at that in a square meter, it's sort of like a wheelbarrow full of needles and garbage gets dumped you know, in the yard every year, every year for 400 years or 300 years. So eventually you have a ton of fuel. And, uh, and if you want to look you know, what that looks like, you know, it's fun to go out and take photographs. These are Nick Morant's photographs. Repeatedly, those asked, and then look at how much change we've had in the Bull Valley. And we can see the beginnings of a you know, real problem is England spruce and white spruce coming up, and these are both very flammable species and yeah, just totally disappearing aspen, which isn't that flammable. So, so that's our firebox. And so, well, what can we really do here? Uh, we can't really manage the weather, we can't really manage the topography, but the two things that we can manage our fuel and human governance. And we can really appreciate the fact that the way these indigenous folks managed for a long, long time is totally different from the way the landscape we're managing today. And you know, what looked like around the of the summer. So we, we are learning, we're reacting, and we're trying to do the best we can. And the, the key place to start with this is at your house. I mean, you really look after yourself first. And Fire Smart is a great program. Uh, it, it addresses you know it's available on the web. You can look at it. You can you know decide for your own walk or you work with your neighbors what it's going to look. And it's make your house and your yard as fireproof as you can because if you have you know, inflammable and flammable roofs, if you remove your conifers out of your yard, if you've got this you know removed all the mulch and stuff, cleaned up your gutters, looked after your house, you stand a pretty good chance of making it. And uh, if you want an example of this. Uh, this is the Miracle House in Lahaina this summer that made it. You know, fire came into town, took out pretty well the whole town, but that house in Lahaina made it. And, uh, and what they had done is they replaced their roof uh, about a year ago, and that roof was probably caught fire. They replaced it with a metal roof. They had taken all that mulch and stuff that was floating right around the house, and they replaced that with gravel. And they trimmed off some of those trees, etc., cetera, and, uh, and it worked. Now, just down the street, 
my family for years and years has had, had, had property in Maui on Front Street, but beside that, just down four blocks from that house, we didn't do so well. Uh, we had a restaurant there, and the fire came through that evening uh, of August 9th, and that's what it looked like in the morning. And our place we thought was pretty fireproof. We just rebuilt the roof and done a bunch of work there. We we're surrounded by the ocean on two sides, but our neighbors were totally flammable. It's a historic town, lots of old buildings, etc. So when the town went, it went with style, and uh, our restaurant was part of it. And then there's this dude that's, that was, lives over at 14th Street and figures, well, nothing could ever happen to him. And when I moved in there in 1990, we had a fire squad house. We had a shape roof, but otherwise, you can see it was gravel all around there. But I couldn't convince Joanne to move in there unless we did some serious landscaping. And that's where we are today. <laughs> so obviously, I've got some work to do. <laughs> and I've got three or four spruce trees on the lot. Every one of them will generate, uh, you know, 5,000. 5,000, 100,000 embers, and it's these embers that burn houses down. They drift into your eaves, they drift into your ceiling and roof, they'll drift into, if you've got a, tree, you know, a bunch of mulch in your yard like this, they'll torch up your trees, and lo and behold, your house will be gone. So, you know, stop by uh, 14th Street over the next year or two and make sure that fellow that gets his, his act together. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not all you can do. I think once we've sort of done what we can do around our houses, et cetera, we need to think about where we live, the region we live in, how we're going to make this landscape more fireproof as a whole. Because a lot of the things we're seeing are fires that come in on those burning periods of micro six to eight kilometers in a day. And no matter what you do, they're going to raise a lot of hell in your town. You're also looking at major evacuations, you're looking at risks of firefighters. So we have to not just look at the houses themselves, our local houses, but what we're going to do at the last at the regional level itself. And luckily in camera, we've had, you know, the camera's a, a sort of a leadership community in this. Uh, Stu Walkinshaw, Harry Martins with the fire department, and other folks have really done a good job at mapping out where our risk in the zone. And obviously, if you look at this map, all the red that surrounds the uh, the town site itself, there are very high risk regionally uh, around this landscape. But, you know, they work within the town boundaries and, and as much as you can to, uh, to try and alleviate the problem. And, uh, and they won awards for the work they've done. Uh, all that country in orange up there is uh, in the center of the picture. That's land that they've worked with to have been or worked with, with uh, participating agencies like Forest Canada, et cetera, to have been. And as many of you are aware, you can you know, get somebody to come to your house and help you with your fire smarting. And so a lot of work has been done to try and uh, at a community level and, uh, and cameras taking a leadership role in this for a long time. But again, we need to sort of branch out from that to say, okay, well, you know, what are our main threats? So we've got threats from uh, many of old growth forest areas that are to the upwind of us. And, uh, and so we need to sort of look at regionally about how we might uh, reduce the threats from those areas. And again, uh, we, we've been lucky enough to have some amazing folks that uh, uh, worked here. I worked many years with a fellow called Ian Benjali, and one of his uh, bugbears was the park boundary. This is how the park boundary your map used to look like just up in the Harvey Heights. This is about 1995, that picture. And so this was obviously a, a big issue for the town of Camelot, is how would you manage that when the fire came out of Bath Park, crossed over into Harvey Heights, and then headed for Silvertown. <laughs> so uh, Ian had many sleepless nights over the years, and he'd uh, worked as an assistant command team for years across the country, and saw what fire would do and realized this is going to be a problem. Then we got um, pine needle into the forest there too, and that was another issue. So we didn't work really hard, and this is, I guess you could call them Bengali Meadows, just along the park boundary there. And we uh, managed to uh, work with Parks Canada and the local folks uh, in the uh, Alberta government, the town of Canmore, a whole bunch of people to suggest that this had to be a major fuel break to, uh, to protect the town. Uh, we couldn't. You know, those days with the Alberta government, but we didn't trip with that and then we were more closer to the town itself. But he was quite successful. Uh, and there's the park boundary there. You can see that he managed to get major thinking done. And then Jane Park, of course, Canada has now gone in there. It's this area too, and done a lot of burning there. And then beyond that, they did a major prescribed burn in 2003. It burned all the way. In fact, you know, it's burned all the way up to where the bison are right now, all the way up the Cascade Valley and Florida there. So this has all been. Is all great good in their habitat, and it's all held by a major fuel break along with Y here at the park boundary. 
So again, this is what I know, the most prototypical large area park management work that's been done. And it, you know, and it wasn't easy. I mean, convinced folks that they needed to move that amount of wood out of there. And then to do the burning, uh, that was the first time burning that was done in May that year to try and clean up the slash. And that's originally right off the back wall here where that picture was taken just before uh, uh, the, the, the library was built. So, you know, it was a pretty uh, exciting piece of fire management that was done there, but it uh, made beautiful meadows. And then I think the thing that Ian managed to sell folks on, the, particularly in parts of Canada, was that, you know, you're going to need a combination of ways to do this. You're going to need mechanical, like, you know, get all the uh, logging sector there. You're going to need to use a combination of fire mechanical. And then with the environmental groups, when we worked with them, we said, listen, if we do this much of logging, et cetera, uh, we'll pump, we'll, we'll um, to mitigate that with a lot of fire burning. Of course, then that's way more than that. So that sort of combination of mechanical and fire uh, eventually is, uh, becomes a solution to reducing your fuel, providing your good labor habitat, making good elk habitat, and at the same time, you know, that's still good. But here's what it looks like today. And this is where sort of the regional approach would be, you know, you need to think about, you know, what can we do? So there's the Instatos there. And there's the park boundary. And then we have this. So this was never really, you know, worked out what to do here. North Canada, it was uh, province of Alberta's built some big fuel breaks here. Uh, Parks Canada, the parks built some fuel breaks here. But we still have all of this here. So, you know, none of this is really thought through very well because, in essence, you would like to have your best fire protection right next to your community, not two kilometers away. So what's happening? You know, we've got a great political program. Just slightly in the wrong spot. We try, but you know, sometimes we miss. <laughs> this is what it should look like, and there's been some great examples in the states, is where your community is completely tightly locked in to where you want your feet up. If I just want to here, and then you will have your prescribed burning or your wildfire area out here, but it's so close that you reduce your perimeter around your community, and you can get at this line here with. Normal fire trucks, you probably have water here. Everything's much closer when your perimeter is close. And then you and you thought this out and you folks know how to manage this area in close. So this is sort of the answer for what needs to be done is to have a very seamless uh, transition from the community itself out to the wildland area, but not a big break in the middle like we've got a camera. So you know what needs to be done just over in the fair home bench then is to somehow come up with a management plan that would say, okay, if we have to, we would be back burning right off a line that's right close to the town. But in general, what you would want to see is that all this is managed right up seamlessly to Parks Canada's management out here at the border. So you want a very seamless management program that goes from the community out to there. And from what I can see, the only way, and this is sort of what I'm trying to suggest here tonight, the best way this can be done is not by having provincial government or the federal government or anybody else managing it. But let's go back to sort of the idea of the seasonal round that the folks that live in this town can do the best job. We know the weather, we know the terrain, we have local firefighters here that know the job and try and get sort of a local localized community going. Because you know I, I, I think this idea that we're going to go, you know, forever the fire teams that come in from the other from Mexico or something like that. Uh, and work on your problem isn't going to last. Eventually, we're going to have to take some responsibility for the landscape right next to us. And one of the ways I think we could look at this and say, okay, if we did set up a community zone here, is that we made $7 million off the table here. There's another $5 million in the problem. So, in essence, a war here. So, if the town took a proactive viewpoint and said, we're going to have a community fire zone. This could be financed. You could go slow, but sure, it doesn't have to be done all the year like this was done. But you could, you know, work your way out and design fuel breaks and fire use action lines that would be very effective. And of course, there's all sorts of all sorts of modern machinery in how to do that. So if you look at you know, some of the critical areas we look at, we just talked about the parallel bench here. There's a shoulder of rival here, real scary one here, Gold Creek. Fire starts on one on a windy day, it's going to cut the corner and go through one man's passage all over the three sisters in about 45 minutes. So, we're in Valley, I wonder why we need with that. And so, there's lots of work that needs to be done here in the community forest. 
And I think if you took the larger viewpoint and said, listen, we want to manage that from the town's perspective, I think we would find a lot of support out of the federal government and the provincial government to say, listen, for these community fire zones that might run out seven kilometers from any community, the priority should be with the community itself to decide okay, how that's going to be managed, when it's going to be managed, and put together a system for how to do it. And one of the neatest things I thought that came out of the work that Ian and Brian, etc., everybody did up in, on Fairhold Bench was that right after they, the next couple of years after they'd done the burning, they brought the uh, local fire departments up there and let them do, uh, do the fuel cleanup and prescribed burning in the fuel break. So they would get involved with the helicopter, see how ignition works, get out there, see how it goes, and really see how fire works. And, uh, and then they you know, got to see the whole landscape of how what was trying to be done uh, with that with that with that fuel break, and I think half those firefighters that worked out there from the camera department or the EID uh, big part group, you said they probably went home and went, why did we have this large chunk of fuel between the Barrel or the, you know the Carrot Creek fuel break and uh, Cougar Creek and stuff like that? Why isn't this more seamless? I'm sure they could have thought well, so there's things that could be done to make this done better. But the big thing is that you know these folks got to see how fire works. Uh, there's a basic rule in the fire business you have to fight fire with fire and uh, when i'm interviewing people in various communities and stuff about how they would deal with an emergency in the situation i say well, have you ever held a drip coach and if they haven't in the fire department i go well i don't think you're going to likely have much luck in the day you have to you will deal with it if you're depending on a, you know a fire team that's in from some other part of the province or some other part of canada uh you know and you don't have that local skill within your fire department you're likely to be in trouble The Canada Fire Support Committee again would have this very integrated uh, system that goes right up to the edge of town. Would have a fire disaster line. Of course, I you know this is my favorite job. No, let's go back. It's always my favorite job on the on the fire line is to be the work. You know, <laughs> do the burning along the edges of these lines. And uh, and, it, and when this is working well, it's really nothing so like it. And then after you're done, uh, it looks like up on uh, up in the Fairhome Bench on that, that, that fuel break now. Uh, it's excellent wildlife habitat, super fair habitat. Uh, and uh, and I think the idea here is to convince people that you made a healthy landscape and don't fill people full of fear, but fill them full of you know, positive vibes. Listen, we're doing good work here. We're saving our ecosystem. We're going back to the long-term ecosystem the way it was. That, that has real benefits to it. And as they say, you know, fear is a good starter. So you can scare you about spruce trees in your yard. But I think if you want long term support for a program like that, people are going to have to see the benefits of it. And that would be with a healthy ecosystem and a community that's so eager to deal with that and provide it. So that's sort of our story. And I think the things that we uh, we can manage are uh, fuel, humans, and governance. That's what we can really manage. We can't do much about the weather, we can't do much about topography. We have to recognize that we're part of an incredible transition from you know an ecosystem that went for 100 to 150 years with those indigenous folks burning this valley, and all within two centuries we've changed it to what it is today, and we changed what was a really localized management system, the seasonal rounds that these folks used to live in this valley and made, and made it work for hundreds of years, thousands of years. What we have today, we have very centralized management, but I think we need to somehow pull that back a bit and try and set up sort of an idea that community forests are the way to go. And, you know, for me, I guess, you know, this summer was just uh, the hardest out of Windermere. And so you're looking across the lake at thistles for about a month. And uh, this was the fire on Mount Bruce. And you really did get to see sort of what drives the BC program. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a big show. They brought in a big fire camp. They had people all over the mountain there. There was firefighters in from all over North America uh, and helicopters and the whole thing. And, uh, but you really recognize that kind of what was driving the whole thing was underneath it with the log industry, here's the mill with, with that radium. And so what they're trying to do is protect this timber just for the mill. And this is the view from you know, our project of Windermere. We're protecting this, this urban development here. <clears throat> but it, you know, really, the firefighters, they did their job. Actually, this, they stopped this fire, they held it on the hillside, and everybody went home. And of course, there's a nice sign up there. Thank you, firefighters. Boy, I was I was thankful that afternoon after that wind event, what they did. I was helping a friend up the valley a lot. It was, it was really scary. So you really want to thank the firefighters. 
for what they did. But they recognize, you know, when you work with these crews, especially after they've been back to the same place three times in 40 years, like Los Alamos, and finally the place just about burnt down totally, they realize, you know, we don't put fires out. What they do is they put them on. You know, they're an emergency team that's sent in by Ottawa or sent in by Edmonton. They put that for Victoria. They put that fire out and then they move on to the next one. They leave your community and they leave you with a situation where you're going to have more fuel, you're going to have more development, you know, and all you're waiting for is a drier, windier day for the next time. And you don't really solve the problem. It's reactive and we need to somehow get proactive and get back into the seasonal round that really does the job. And if you go here, I've got a trailer just up there that uh, goes right underneath that room that you must be wondering some days how things was going to look at. So, you know, that's my question to the group tonight is if could Canmore be a prototype community that safely integrates a fire smart urban area in the surrounding parks and protected areas where fire is an important part of the ecosystem for restoration and maintenance? And I think Canmore could take the lead. Uh, and it's in Canada. We have, you know, an amazing group of folks in the Sally that have. John worked here for a long time. Uh, we've done all the you know, things as right as we could do at the community level. And so that's sort of a matter now is sort of reaching out to the province, reaching out to the federal government across Canada and say, listen, you know, if you gave us some controls to manage the forest, and we looked and said, you know, what can we do for an income system, system so that we can you know, do this? Uh, you know, could we you know, start? And we would probably start small. I think we'd probably start with maybe the you know, going out beyond Harvey Heights as far as the park boundary, that was obviously just done up behind Silvertip. You might look at Green Valley, maybe around Sioux Three Sisters, because you've got issues here that really tie into the community, like the wildlife quarters. And then maybe in time, if, if it's going well, maybe the North Center, maybe the corner of Gold Creek there would be another spot where the community, uh, with the community fire might pick in right here. This this would be managed. But whatever, the program, the idea would be is within a whole fire shed of Tamor, within about 10 kilometers, that the community would start to take control over how that works and how it gets done. So that would be my, my idea, you know, maybe what we could do in the future. And then once you have folks like this, which fire department, this fellow is with probably with uh, uh, Big Horn, you know, once you have people that can do this day by day and they're in the in your community and they know what it's all about, I think you've got beyond with your housing level fire smart and your regional level fire smart. You stand a pretty good chance of that providing for both the park, park surrounding us and your house that you'll have to do a lot of long term landscape. Thank you. Well, uh, not only can uh, Cliff White fill a room, but he also can uh, man an audience. Thank you very much, though. Um, and so, um, there's a lot of you, so so here's here's a rough, here's my fearless proposition for how we might uh, do this. So some of you will have questions. Um, there's a there's a, a great a great audience uh, listening on Zoom, and Tanya's going to see if there's any uh, worthwhile uh, questions there. And uh, Cliff, uh, that wily bugger, has given us a question. And uh, and so because um, so here's my I propose to. Uh, Ask you to if you've got a, a really good question for Cliff, go ahead. Let's take a few minutes and, and get those on the floor and see and, and see if Cliff can answer them. I also want to discuss the question that he's posed to the community again. Um, and uh, and if I'm if I may just a preamble for this, can I just ask you a question? If we don't do this, are we safe? Well, I mean, eventually you're going to get the combination of weather and fuels that will take you out. I'll take it going out three times in the last 30 days. We'll have our day too. So that's what the state hopes. And there's a, a solution of some kind, whatever that might be. Um, let's get to this question in a second here. Think about your response to this question, and I'll ask for you know, some great thought leaders and, and uh, kind of influencers in the room. So I uh, invite you to wait in. But in the interim, if you have a question for Mr. White, please put up your hand and uh, let us know your name and uh, give us a question in, a, in your best teacher voice. Who's got a question? Hey. Thanks. Um, who are you? Mechanical Forestry, Spray Lakes Valley, the Spray, uh, the Spray Lakes um, Company, and how they would accomplish this for our behalf. You know, you look at what's happening in Canada's country and they're, they've got a block they're allowed to cut. Is there a better way to do it that you would recommend? 
That's Joey O'Brien, anyone in case you didn't know already. Thanks, <laughs> Joey. Well, I think you, you've got to draw a line between what's industrial forestry and what's community forestry. Industrial forestry is trying to make money and don't bad help it in some ways because at least we have mills. And the uh, United States had a real reaction against logging and national forest, and they lost a lot of their mills. At least here, if we start to build a community forest, we have some place to take the wood too because we have a viable mill down in Spring Lakes in Cochrane, there's other viable mills in Rave, et cetera. So I think in some ways, I'm in a viable logging industry, but it's been a log industry. You know, it's, uh, there's no doubt about it. Folks aren't that happy with some of that. And that will change over time. I'm not sure that, you know, I mean, I pre preferentially like to see a lot more fire and a lot less logging in some of these towns. But uh, the, the idea that we have mills where we can process that timber, that makes it possible in a lot of these I'm talking about. With your mills, you're going to be in trouble. Plus, is a question. Heather, go ahead. Hi, I'm Heather. Um, I'm just wondering if this conversation is happening within council, within administration, have you put this proposal forward to our town leaders? No, I haven't. But, you know, we, I guess we've discussed it in various venues over the years. I used to be on the uh, with the biosphere board, et cetera. So I you know, was long term involved with this. But I mean, I mean, obviously, with uh, you know, the, the work that was done at uh, Carrot Creek, et cetera, and and the Bam Foundry, you know, we've had lots of discussions over the years. But you know, the communities do what they can do, and the provinces have their role. And what's got left was that little spot at Georgia in the middle, and it hasn't been picked up yet. And it's going to take some real innovative management. And then I don't, I think it's going to have to be the communities that reach out to say, listen, we're willing to do this, but we have to have the money. And the, and, the, and the control of the trees and the lint and the timber, if you will, to be able to do that. And, uh, and I, I, the province is the sad thing about what's going on right now is that as we get into these one after the other catastrophic summers, the provinces spend less and less time, you know, worrying about individual communities. Don't throw money at them and say, try and fix it yourself. But there's only so much you can do if you don't have all the leaders to do water management. And, uh, and and if you really don't have the control, if you're just waiting for a provincial grant to do your fire management for your fuel management, you know, a lot of things get missed. And so I really think that, that you know, we're going to need some community control and we've got the skin in the game way more than somebody does in Ottawa or Edmonton. That's it. Yes, I know. Uh, in front of me, I have chronic tinnitus, and I'm really acoustically challenged. So I hope I'm not uh, reiterating. Uh, uh, I'm inquiring regarding the uh, newly formed free camping, the vast expanses of free camping that is uh, uh, now a possibility. I think this focuses on our bone meadows. Uh, Industrial area, neighborhood but we, we the consciousness, the awareness of, of, of fire and people that look to what am I saying? I'm kind of babbling, but um, how uh, would that hurt your um, a balance of having a uh, conscious and <laughs> And, um, and then uh, a, a management strategy. Okay. Yeah, I, I, again, that's sort of a municipal, that is a municipal issue I've gathered from when I was a little bit. So uh, I, you know, I think most campgrounds are pretty well on their game about how to manage fire. It's been years since we've had a fire come out of a campground. I, and, uh, I think I was speaking to the, the actual um, boundaries and the status of this meeting. Oh, I see. Well, I guess again, it would come down to managing the campground, yeah. et cetera, in a way that's as safe as possible. Yeah. And again, it would uh, sort of say, again, the campgrounds are they're pretty good at do what they do. Yeah. Thanks for your great question. Yeah. And I'm going to pass it on to Bob Sanford. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Sanford, as you pointed out. And again, I just want to thank you, Cliff, for your outstanding presentation. I think many of us come to these because we rely on you for expert advice based on really sound science. And once again, we provided that. Thank you. I find uh, again tonight that your presentation is based more or less on what we know about the last century. And also, to a large extent, focused on what is more or less the status quo. And 
our agency, I regret, has now projected that we have already surpassed 1.5 degrees of warming. We're likely past two, given the fact that we are only gradually reducing the increase in the carbon dioxide emissions reductions. And also we have a new and extraordinary factor that is making it very difficult for nations to achieve their carbon dioxide emission reduction goals, and that's war. And uh, my question for you is that we see now that given that Canada is warming at least twice the rate of the rest of the globe, that we're looking at at least 2.6 to 3 degrees Celsius, certainly in Canada and certainly in the Canadian North. And we're probably moving closer to four. So we have higher smarted our house as best we could, but uh, our neighbors haven't got there yet. And uh, also, I think that anyone working on fire, and this is something you taught me, but you may regret this, but uh, you taught me to see the landscape through the eyes of fire. And when I like to my front window there, all I see is fuel. So my question is, we are, appear to be experiencing bigger, hotter, faster fires. What can we expect in a hotter, much hotter, and clearly drier west? Well, I guess it's obvious. I mean, we have, uh, you know, five to ten uh, critical burning days now. Uh, we may have twenty to thirty through season in the future, and uh, and so you know, really, it's the perfect storm. But all you can really do again is, you know, we can manage our governance and we can manage our fuels. And, uh, you know, and, and, and one thing, you know, I guess we have to watch out for is that bureaucracy being bureaucracy will blame this on anything. If your town burns down and they can blame it on climate change, they will. And if that then it gets everybody in the kitty to go, well, nothing we could have done, well, that's stupid. <laughs> so, you know, I think we have to sort of acknowledge that we're going into a perfect storm here. Maybe we better refit the sales a little bit and think ahead. And uh and not, you know, and really acknowledge that we can look after ourselves to some level here. And uh, and the worse it is in terms of climate, the better we better do in looking after ourselves. So that's Cliff talking about proactive and EDC. And and you'll know that you know he's gonna have to spend the last 10 minutes of his talk doing a really good pitch actually on us becoming uh, uh parts, you know, basically a community forest. And so it would be lovely, wouldn't it, if that's if that's an idea um, that's going places, it would be not, I'm gonna avoid kind of metaphors about kind of ideas catching fire and stuff. That would just be too easy. Um, but if that's the if that's an idea that's going places, you know, this might be where it starts. But just out of curiosity, do you have an opinion on the answer to your question? If you if you think if you want to comment on that, pop up your hand and I'll call on you. It's a good idea. Maybe something that could happen. Did you want to just comment on that? You know, you had your hand up a second. Did you want to? Yeah. Oh. Somebody. Did you want to comment? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm doing this by a lot. I've been on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Again, and Cliff, we're, we're perfect to have you in our community. Uh, I, I mean, your involvement in. Uh, Prescribed burn and uh, landscape uh, level views of fire risk, uh, you know, goes back late 80s, early 90s, I, I think, when, when you started. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's a long time. So, um, yeah, so, so thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I live on the, uh, you know, on the periphery as well, um, the interface and uh, uh, up on the top of uh, Hospital Hill. Um, and I, I do look out at the Nordic Center, a uh, place I do a lot of, and the Georgetown area. And uh, so that was one of the two areas we highlighted. And, you know, I continually ask myself, you know, how can we, how can we make that work for fire, but also for the other values such as, uh, you know, recreation and wildlife. And, uh, 
Yeah, I, I do believe there's there's kind of a, a you know a win win uh, potential to uh, you know the reduce fire risk. Um, I, I ski a lot at the Nordic Center in the shade in the winter when it's cold, and we're missing out on all those great views. Uh, and uh, you know, like there's something that you know is is uh, doable up there. I believe I'm a little less sure about the wildlife dimension. I mean, when I see some of those areas, open areas there, I see the giant dog park, right? And uh, and we're trying to you know um, open that up to wildlife, yes, the wildlife, um, but also uh, you know we as humans have ways. We view the landscape and preferences and how we use it and a certain amount of privilege as well. Um, so how we make all that work, I have no idea at all. But uh, uh, I, I really uh, support the idea of uh, the community approach and I applaud you for that. And that's my two cents. Thanks, Jacob. Um, other commentators uh, to address those few questions uh, up on the screen. Sandra, a couple of other questions. I have a response. Mr. Chair, do you want to talk about this from your bias here, Chair? One board member. No, I mean, I have more questions, but I don't know. Awesome. All right. You had mentioned the, you know, the relatively flammable trees like White Springs and the Pine, and then also Aspen. And I'm wondering, is there a relative importance to removing one and adding another, or could you do some of the mix? species thing, sort of to Jacob's point, maybe we don't remove a lot of trees, but we have some aspens that have any protective value and how easy is that to do? Yeah, for sure. If you can put aspen birch, uh, the deciduous trees are, are a good idea. And uh, I would guess maybe 50 years from now, you, if you want to have a spruce tree in your yard, your insurance agent will tell you how much it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. and your neighbors may get mad too, because it might cost them too. <laughs> so, as a community, we could advocate for planting out. I mean, I don't even know how you do that. Like, <laughs> planting aspen is an easy thing. I understand. No, it's that. totally easy. Yeah. yeah. It might be a little hard if you're super lined with the woods. Like, when the roots get in there, but it's, you know, they'll have trees. <laughs> Hi, Cliff. Hi. Um, I guess I, I love this idea of the community sort of being more proactive in terms of uh, managing fire on the landscape or, or, uh, selective logging. What I'm struggling with is jurisdiction, I guess. Um, a number of those areas that you identified, and certainly you know, the main on, on the south side of the valley, within the town of Camera, but owned uh, for more intensive purposes by the government of Alberta, um, both Bob and the Park, um, without having them being part of a solution. I'm not sure you know, we, can, we can, you know, rally all we want to to try and do things ourselves, but I think we have to be at the table. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's more of just a, a comment rather than, than a question or, or something that we need to seriously consider. It's kind of well, like going to be at the table. Totally agree. Unless you get a prototypical <laughs> agreement to say, listen, this is the fire shift of the community, and this is this is something we need to look at probably across North America. That we can't have this sort of interface where you've got a, you know, particularly the states, it really shows up where you've got federal lands right next to a community, and who knows what the feds are doing. And especially the governance in the feds right now, nobody trusts them. So, again, the sort of putting it back to some sort of a community thing, and you can, you know, regulations can be put in place or agreements can be put in place to say, this is the latitude the community has. And, you know, probably the best example we can look at in our valley right now is the town of Banff. And that used to be owned by Parks Canada and managed out of Ottawa. And rules were put into place about how you could have a town site and local governance and make it work so the feds thought you could have that in a national park. And I would say that works better now, is managed better locally than it was when you had a $250 solution that my folks used to use when they wanted something, they would fly to Ottawa, cut a deal and come back, and who cares what you run in the town park. And uh, in those days are done. You have to go before the town, and the rules are there about how it works. And that could be done with a community force too. Last question for uh, this uh, young lady in her room. Bye. Thanks, Gary. Hi, I'm Caitlin Miller. Um, I actually work for the Town Camera. I'm the Director of Emergency Management. 
Uh, so just a comment on all of this. I think it's great. I really like the regional approach as well. And I think it's really important that we continue to build those relationships with our regional partners. Um, so we recently put in place a regional emergency management bylaw with the town of Banff so we can work on some of these things. Um, and we continue to work forward towards increasing our capacity for emergency management, which includes everything from mitigation, prevention, um, response, and then of course recovery. Um, and we can continue to work with our provincial partners as well. So uh, at our most recent Canmore Emergency Management Agency, we did have a member of Alberta Wildfire come out. Um, they're always invited uh, and they, they took the time to come out. Um, so see us at our agency meeting and have that conversation. We do have a few projects on the go with them like Bow Valley uh, Vegetation Management Plan. Um, and we continue to work with our local partners, who we you referenced to Walk and Show, who's in the back right now. So um, we continue to work uh, with them as well, because those, those relationships are what's going to move us forward and continuing to build those. Um, it's a, a council priority as well to make sure that we are building those relationships with our regional partners. And this is one great way that we do it. And we, um, uh, all the regional directors of emergency management meet frequently as well, because we can't do anything on our own, um, not in this valley. Uh, we're all dependent on each other. So that includes um, working with the province pretty closely and uh, using our provincial contacts sometimes to push things forward when we can and if we can. Uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of making sure that we're fire smart, not just at your homes, although that's really important too. And um, our fire chief can be here tonight, but if you need a home assessment, fire at canmore.ca to book your fire smart home assessment. Just gonna put a little teaser out there. <laughs> um, and just really happy that we're having this talk and talking about it because it's so important for our community um, and important to be top of mind for everybody. So thank you for coming out and thank you everybody for your passion and um, listening and being here and wanting to make a change. No, I think it's terrific. I mean, we've got the table set here. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I had a community in Canada, I could likely make a leap, might be this one. Uh, you've got the model with uh, well, the Bison Institute itself, uh, other agreements on the BCI and stuff like that. And it, you know, really is just a matter of saying, well, somebody has to take responsibility and how the hell are you going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and who has the best credibility in the room? I would say you end up with a community forester that everybody knows and is working through everybody's issues, whether it be where you want sunshine in the Nordic Center, <laughs> where you don't think you want your medals, and, uh, and, and folks felt comfortable with that, we would get someone. Otherwise, I mean, you probably have the same experience I've had. I've been in meetings for 40 years with you know various federal and provincial entities, all sorts of permutations, and it's only rare to get something done on the ground, but we need something here that's, it's, this is serious. And, uh, and we need something that lasts for a long time. We've looked at how indigenous folks made this work for 40, 50 centuries. We need to come up with a model that worked for us for 40, 50 centuries. And all these damn meetings don't help. <laughs> Karen, could I uh, just support that from the United Nations perspective? <laughs> First of all, I think it's really important to know that the global climate solidarity cavalry is not coming to save us. <laughs> the federal government is not coming to save us. Though so they can certainly help the province of government, government of Alberta is not going to save us. We are relying on ourselves. We save ourselves. And this is a universal theme that is emerging in all climate debates. It's at the community level that our salvation resides. And we need to build a strong community to do what has just been said. Bob Sanford, we're leave it there with that. We really lost both of words at the very end. Um, I think uh, there's, I want to just say that there's this, whether it's Mr. Sanford or this gentleman at the front or the two patrons in the front row with, with some wonderful leadership from the uh, from the, uh, from the, from the town of government, from the town of Tamar and other jurisdictions. This, this, I tend to agree, this may be a very good time to make something important happen and, uh, and much at stake. It's, this is not a trivial proposition that we can safely ignore. So, um, uh, and it's five past, almost 10 past eight. So um, uh, I'm going to leave you wanting more. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, uh, in, in, in a second, I'll, I invite you to join me in thanking uh, Cliff Wright 
Um, you probably haven't heard the last of this issue. Uh, we have your email address if you registered. If you, if you didn't register through the, then just come and give it to Tanya or Abby and we'll take it from there. Big thanks to Tanya for organizing us. Uh, great thank you. And a big, 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 big thanks to Abel for putting uh, this together. And a huge thanks to our uh, good work. Thank you, everyone, so much for making the time to come out today. Just wanted to mention next month's Earth Talk is going to be on the topic of human wildlife coexistence. Um, Nick and one of Nick, our biosphere staff, and one of his wildlife ambassadors are presenting uh, named Derek. So hope to see you out there. That is on November 20th. So yeah, thanks again, everyone. Um, and thank you so much. Folks. I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>